This morning in Washington, D.C., they're releasing what they're calling an evangelical manifesto. Do you think this document defines evangelicals in a non-political fashion? The evangelical community has an identity crisis. American evangelicals are like the rest of Americans. They pick and choose among presidential candidates. What we are trying to say is, is that every now and then the church takes a deep breath. I view it as like a corporate quiet time where you take a deep breath and you say, have we been all we have claimed to be? An evangelical, evangelical. manifesto. This is Reasonable Faith, conversations with Dr. William Lane Craig. I'm Kevin Harris, and whether you're listening on radio or podcast, we'd like to welcome you to Reasonable Faith. We think you'll find the topics we discuss on this show to be fascinating and enriching wherever you are on your personal journey. William Lane Craig is a noted philosopher, scholar, theologian, and speaker. And on Reasonable Faith, he addresses the big questions of life. And while you're listening, let me remind you of the terrific resources available at ReasonableFaith.com. Org. There you'll find Dr. Craig's articles and books, audio and video of Dr. Craig's debates and speeches at universities all over the world, and a section featuring answers to the questions that you send to us. You'll also find past podcasts, a discussion forum, and audio from Dr. Craig's Defenders class. All this and more at ReasonableFaith.org. Check it out today. We are discussing an evangelical manifesto. Drafted May 7th, 2008 in Washington, D.C. Dr. Craig, it's a declaration of evangelical identity and public commitment. A lot in this manifesto. We've discussed it uh, earlier, and uh, we're going to kind of pick it up in part two here. Uh, Who are some of the people who were some of the leaders who drafted this manifesto? Oz Guinness was one of the principal authors of the manifesto, but also involved were people like Richard Mao from Fuller, Timothy George at Samford University, and Dallas Willard of USC. They were some of the other members of the steering committee. Now, this manifesto gives a couple of mandates, and one is we must reaffirm our identity, and we discuss the seven foundational principles that uh, we ought to hold as evangelical Christians. And the second is we must reform our own behavior. I do want to chase a quick rabbit because I hear a critique a lot Uh, on the seven foundations that were given. One of the foundations is that we must reach out to the lost, those people who don't know Christ, those people who are separated from God, uh, those people who are in need of the salvation that Christ offers. And then we must do exactly as Jesus did to feed the hungry and visit the poor and the oppressed, the socially despised, and, and so on. What we're often accused of is going as Christians to places of disaster or places of poverty And only doing that as a means to proselytize and evangelize. And I've read two blogs on the Internet this week that accuse us of doing that very thing. They see that as as rather hypocritical. So, well, okay, how do we do this and not be hypocritical about it? Obviously, we need to have compassion for those who are suffering, independent of whether or not they become Christians, that we have compassion on them simply as human beings. And although some of these bloggers may say that this is not what we do, I think the facts don't bear that out. Organizations like World Vision and Food for the Hungry and just people who volunteer from local churches to go to Hurricane Katrina ravaged places and rebuild homes and help folks or take folks into their own homes when they've been rendered homeless, show that people genuinely do this because they care about people and not just about making proselytes. I have personally witnessed and been involved with an organization called Food for the Poor. They never made the homeless people that they fed in Jamaica and the Caribbean and others sit through a sermon before they got something to eat. Hmm. And that was, that's, that's been a criticism. I don't know anybody who does that. I'm sure there's somebody somewhere. But that is certainly not what the mainstream Christian relief organizations do, and that's certainly what, not what the New Testament you know, says. Sure. So. We, we can do both evangelism and care for the physical needs of suffering people without making these preconditions of each other. We must reform our own behavior Mm -hmm. is the the second uh, mandate. Now, 12 ways here, it looks like. Yes. Look at number one. This is, I think, one of the most powerful paragraphs in the whole document. These are ways in which we as evangelicals have betrayed 
our beliefs by our behavior. We haven't lived up to what we claim is true. And the first paragraph says this, all too often we have trumpeted the gospel of Jesus, but we have replaced biblical truths with therapeutic techniques. Worship with entertainment. Discipleship with growth in human potential. Church growth with business entrepreneurialism. Concern for the church and for the local congregation with expressions of the faith that are churchless and little better than a vapid spirituality. We've replaced meeting real needs with pandering to felt needs and replaced mission principles with marketing precepts. In the process, we have become known for commercial, diluted, and feel-good gospels of health, wealth, human potential, and religious happy talk, each of which is indistinguishable from the passing fashions of the surrounding world. Ouch. All I can say is, ouch. (laughs) Ouch. I agree. That is so powerful, and I think that all of us who have watched some of these televangelists uh, and, and other things on Christian television uh, resonate with this paragraph in, in terms of the vapid spirituality, the religious happy talk, the feel-good gospels of health and wealth and human potential that are I- exhibited there. And these really do betray genuine evangelical beliefs, I think. Is there room for any entertaining aspects or any entertainment aspects? and Sure. It doesn't say here that worship has to be boring. What it says is that too often we've replaced worship with entertainment, and I think that that is a, a valid criticism. I think so, too. Yeah. I, I saw, yeah. Kevin, just th- this week, a story that certain Christian organizations and leaders were encouraging churches to shut down or cancel one of their services, and instead go out and minister to the poor. And I thought, what a misplaced priority and understanding of what church is supposed to be for. If you think that the purpose of church is for entertainment or for fellowship, then sure, cancel one of the church services and go minister to the poor. That, that's all right. You don't need to be entertained. You can, more important, inter, uh, help the poor. But if you understand that the purpose for which the church gathers is to worship God, that that's why we meet, is to worship him, then to cancel worship for the sake of ministering to the poor smacks of idolatry. This is utterly misplaced priority. So it seems to me that this idea of replacing worship with entertainment is something that is a real danger that feeds into the kind of attitude that I just described. All too often, the next one says, all too often we have prided ourselves in our orthodoxy, but grown our churches through methods and techniques as worldly as the worldliest of Christian adaptations to passing expressions of the spirit of the age. Well, again, I think it's talking about using materialistic sorts of techniques and methods that are maybe designed to to grow churches or or get people involved and so forth, but don't necessarily reflect a deep spirituality. Yeah. Well, churches tend to think if we could just, you know, invest in some real good laser lights, a good laser light show. And, uh, you know, the world is always going to have better spotlights and uh, tech, uh, technology as yeah. far as their inter- they're in that business. Since we're not in the entertainment business, why embrace the spirit of the age? And yeah, we can have some stuff, but it's certainly not our priority. No, um, and you know. not the thing that we And they go be. so obsolete, Bill. I mean, today's laser light and today's laptop is going to be obsolete in eight months. So, you know, uh, I know that's controversial, and, and, and I think the d- disclaimer would be, ah, oh, there's nothing wrong with uh, technology, but it's certainly not the business that we're in. Yeah. And, and I think what this document simply does is it calls us to self-examination and saying, are we going over the top here? Have my attitudes become inappropriate? And there are extremes to be avoided on either end. Next says, all too often we have failed to demonstrate the unity and harmony of the body of Christ and fallen into factions defined by the accidents of history and sharpened by truth without love. 
rather than express the truth and grace of the gospel. Accidents of history? Well, I think there they're talking about, for example, denominational origins and little groups that form because of geographical uh, proximity and so forth. And it results in a kind of divisiveness and turf jealousy that promotes division among Christians. It's unnecessary. Next says, all too often we have traced our roots to powerful movements of spiritual revival and reformation, but we ourselves are often atheists unawares, secularist in practice, who live in a world without windows to the supernatural and often carry on our Christian lives in a manner that has little operational need for God. Yeah. And I I think what that's reflecting is people who don't really act as though we live in a world that is controlled by a supernatural God, they just sort of get along without him in the way they live their lives normally. We live as practical atheists, right. even though we give lip service to... Yeah. Well, and it's easy to do that. that and, I think we do need to, to, to fight against. It's easy to do it in such a, an affluent country like America. That's a good point. You know, we could just... All too often we have attacked... This is the next one. The evils and injustices of others, such as the killing of the unborn, as well as the heresies and apostasies of theological liberals whose views have developed into another gospel. While we have condoned our own sins, turned a blind eye to our own vices, and lived captive to forces such as materialism and consumerism in ways that contradict our faith. Another ouch there, other aspects of the pro-life movement that can become unkind in its zeal to do that which is good, and that is, you know, to protect life and so on. Yeah, it's important to see that this doesn't in any way downplay the importance of the pro-life cause or the sanctity of life. But what it does say is that very often we ourselves become captive to other forces like materialism and consumerism. And when I think of, again, some of the health and wealth gospel preaching that you see on television, that is so clearly true that God just becomes a sort of facilitator for my having success and prosperity in life. And Mm. and that is a warped gospel. That is also another gospel. All too often we have concentrated on great truths of the Bible, such as the cross of Jesus, but have failed to apply them to to other biblical truths, such as creation. In the process, we have impoverished ourselves and supported a culture broadly careless about the stewardship of the earth and negligent of the arts and the creative centers of society. Right. What they're saying there is, of course, that the central truths of the Bible are things like the cross of Christ, but they're calling us to also recapture biblical teaching about the the creation in the sense that God put man on the earth to tend the garden and to be good stewards of the earth. And therefore, as Christians, we ought to be environmentally conscious about the stewardship of the earth and its resources rather than plundering and exploiting the earth and polluting it, its uh, water and air. We should also be concerned about the stewardship of the earth. And then also they mention fostering the arts and uh, other creative uh, centers. Of I society. hear Francis Schaeffer. Echoes of Francis Schaeffer here. Os Guinness was deeply influenced by Francis Schaeffer, and yeah. I think you do see a lot of Schaeffer in this document. Well, we used to lead. The church at one time uh, was more of a leader in the arts. Oh, my goodness. Think of the, the medieval church, how it, it was the patron of all the great arts, the sculpture, the painting, the architecture. You're absolutely right about Well, what that. happened? I mean, why did we start to downplay an appreciation of the arts and music. It was a it was a withdrawal, and we're supposed to instead to have a, a, a kind of a, a religious counterfeit of those things. Yeah, so often it seems that what we have is a cheapened, kind of tawdry version of of those things. You know, so often Christian <laughs> music or other things are just kind of poor imitations. Rather of, than an authentic ex- creative expression, it can be just a kind of yeah. A they're not on the cutting edge. They're just uh, wannabes. Oh boy, that's a whole nother show. Let's oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it really is. Well, let's see. All too often we have been seduced by the shaping power of the modern world, exchanging a costly grace for convenience, switching from genuine community to an embrace of individualism, softening theological authority down to personal preference, and giving up a clear grasp of truth and an exclusive allegiance to Jesus for a mess of mix-and-match attitudes that are syncretism 
by another name. I guess syncretism should be defined there. There, the, the idea would be that you kind of cobble together your own sort of Christianity that that fits you personally as an individual. This is what this is a religion I like, and I think what they're saying here is that this kind of individualism is uh, a betrayal of evangelical beliefs. We are part of a broader community called the church, and uh, I think that they're saying that we need to see ourselves as that and not think that each of us has the right and the ability to put together our own sort of religion that we want to have that suits our personal fancy. And Dr. Craig, I saw your eyes kind of light up on this one, and that is, it says, All too often mm-hmm. we have disobeyed the great command to love the Lord our God with our hearts, souls, strength, and minds, and have fallen into an unbecoming anti-intellectualism that is a dire cultural handicap as well as a sin. That's remarkable, isn't it? I mean, that they call anti-intellectualism not only a handicap in reaching our culture, but they actually say it's a sin to be anti-intellectual. And certainly this is true of a great great deal of evangelical Christianity today, that it's, it is anti-intellectual, it's, it's shallow. They go on in this paragraph to say that we've often betrayed a high view of science that needs to be recaptured again today. And anti-intellectualism then makes us vulnerable to caricature of mm. the false hostility between science and faith. Yeah. And, and that's what we're often accused of as Christians, that we're hostile to science. Yeah. Mm. And they go on then to say that this unwittingly gives comfort to scientism and naturalism that are rampant in our culture today by setting ourselves up in opposition to science, then that gives all the more credence to the kind of scientific naturalism that says, we really know the truth and you Christians are just backward, ignorant uh, people who know nothing about science. So I think this is absolutely correct that we need to recapture a high view of science and the call of being a, a scientist as a Christian. Yeah, it uses the term scientism there. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a difference between science and scientism. Right, right. This extols science and says we need a high view of science. But scientism is this warped view that science is the only means to truth and the only arbiter of reality. And that is a narrow and, frankly, scientifically uh, unjustifiable view. It's, it's self-refuting. You couldn't show scientifically that science is the only way to truth because that would be a non-scientific argument. It would be a philosophical argument. All too often we have gloried in the racial and ethnic diversity of the church around the world, but remain content to be enclaves of separateness here at home. I think that that's true, sadly. We do talk about how wonderful it is that the church is booming in Africa and growing in Latin America, but many of us uh, attend racially segregated churches here in the United States, we, for one reason or another, haven't managed to really become reflective of the diversity that there is in the body of Christ. We'll just look at a couple of more of these as we end this program, uh, uh, Dr. Craig. They do mention in this Evangelical Manifesto, postmodernism. Yes. Uh, What is their point here? Well, it says that we've succumbed to the passing fashions of the moment and made noisy attacks, I like that, on yesterday's errors like modernism while capitulating tamely to today's errors such as postmodernism. That's a very strong statement, Kevin. It's, it's saying that modernism is an error and that a lot of the attacks on it are just sort of noise, you know, not really very thoughtful. But while we make these noisy attacks on modernism, we capitulate to postmodernism, which is just as bad, the view that there are no objective standards of truth and rationality uh, and, and so forth. And I appreciated that very much because I think that as Christian evangelicals, we need to repudiate both modernism and its scientistic view, but we also repudiate postmodernism with its relativistic and pluralistic view. The manifesto ends with uh, how we need to rethink our place in public life, having to do with behavior. I think uh, it tends to dispel some of the political affiliations 
that uh, we think are more Christian than others. Or, In other words, um, this is an address of how we ought to view politics. What it basically says is that evangelicals are independent of blind allegiance to any political party or group, that we can't be taken to be, so to speak, useful idiots of any sort of political party. We have these positions to affirm, we stand by them, and we're not going to just have blind allegiance to some sort of political party. I think that's, that's quite correct. It also calls for us to be fully involved in the public square, that we don't need to privatize our beliefs. As Christians, we can express these publicly and should be involved. And um, that being evangelical, I, I think it's basically saying being evangelical and being Christian should be your primary identity that comes first ahead of being, say, Democrat or Republican. This is an intriguing title to a uh, paragraph in a section here, The Way of Jesus, Not Constantine. Yeah, this really surprised me, uh, quite honestly, Kevin, reading this. This is a real blast against the idea of the establishment of religion, that, that uh, as Constantine tried to establish Christianity as the state religion of the Roman Empire, they really, really criticize any attempt to establish a state religion, such as, for example, you have in England, where you have this, the, the Church of England. This is very anti-establishmentarianism. Uh, in fact, I, I hardly ever get to use this word. This is, this is a, a document which is, holds to disestablishmentarianism. <laughs> so if you're an anti-disestablishmentarianist, <laughs> you won't like this yeah. document. But basically what it says is that it, it affirms what we have here in the United States, namely the Establishment Clause, that Congress shall make no law that establishes a religion, but then also the Exercise Clause, that we have the freedom to exercise our religion as we see fit. And that's what they're really calling for, is that the state should be neutral uh, rather than have a kind of uh, state-sponsored religion. Of well, it's one of the biggest fears that skeptics, secularists yeah. have, is that we are trying to establish a theocracy. Right. And, this and we're going to take away everybody's uh, DVD player. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. This is saying that we, we repudiate the idea that we want to have a theocracy. We recognize that there is a a uh, religiously neutral public square in which everybody is free to participate, but nobody is free to establish by governmental authority his viewpoint. The thinking is that actually uh, the Christian faith can actually flourish uh, or, or better flourish in, in, in that kind of an environment than yeah. one that could be easily taken over by a fallen man. Well, you know, Kevin, I, although I don't think the document makes that practical point, I think, in fact, you could make the case very convincingly that that's true, that in churches or in countries where you have a state church, like Italy with Catholicism until recently, in England with the state, of, uh, the state church there, in Germany where Catholic or Reformed churches are recognized as state churches, the church has not flourished. The, the mixing of government with church tends to deaden the church. Whereas in a country like the United States, where there is no established church, but there is freedom to evangelize and exercise your faith, well, this is the most evangelized society on earth with the greatest number of Christian organizations and the vibrancy and the life of evangelical faith in America is just unparalleled any place else in uh, the globe. So I think that practically, it is probably the better part of wisdom to say that we don't want to have any kind of a state church, but we want to have a religiously neutral public square. Dr. Craig, your overall assessment of an evangelical manifesto seems to be mostly positive. I think it is positive, Kevin. I think it's a mistake to see this as a document that is saying you need to shed yourself as an evangelical of conservative political views. It, it doesn't say anything of this sort. Rather, it simply calls for us to reaffirm our identity as evangelicals, to reform our behavior where we have lapsed into worldly excesses in many ways, and then to participate freely and openly in the public dialogue in a charitable and civil manner with unbelievers and people of other faiths. And that is a call that I think 
everyone as an evangelical, whether he's politically left or politically right, can agree with and, and should heed. Thank you, Dr. Craig, for spending some time with us. And thank you, the listener, for being here today. This podcast is available at reasonablefaith.org, as well as a wealth of audio, video, and written materials from William Lane Craig. People all over the world have benefited from the insights of Dr. Craig, and we invite you to browse our resources at reasonablefaith.org. And when you give to Reasonable Faith or purchase our resources, you help us expand into more media and speaking events, taking Christ to a world of big questions. So be sure and visit us at reasonablefaith.org. I'm Kevin Harris. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Reasonable Faith with William Lane Craig.